watching NBC4, the Tri-State News Channel. And now, Chuck Scarborough, Sue Simmons, Janice Huff, and Len Berman. This is News Channel 4 at 11. Haunted New York. You'll never dine alone in this Brooklyn restaurant where the tortured ghosts of mafia victims are said to provide hair-raising company. The last mile of a long campaign. In just hours, New Yorkers will choose to stay the course or change direction. While in New Jersey, it's a clash between a political newcomer and an old-timer called out of retirement. Good evening. The candidates in their commercials have had their say, and now it is time for the voters to speak. It'll take a major upset to unseat New York Governor George Pataki, but his challengers are counting on just that, campaigning tonight to squeeze out every last vote. Our team coverage begins with political reporter J.D. Dapper. Jay? Well, Sue, tonight Tom Golisano is counting on money. Carl McCall is counting on Democrats. And George Pataki is counting on all those polls being right. In the final hours, Carl McCall is counting on political star power to help him disprove the polls. Two new ones out tonight showing him 16 to 21 points down. Democrats insisting that doesn't mean he can't win. I'm telling you. There's enough people in this room and enough other people we've got going around carrying these McCall signs to turn this election. If everybody who's really for him showed up and voted tomorrow, he would win. Do you doubt that? No. no. After a full day of campaigning across the city, McCall brought both Clintons along for the last two rallies, this one in the Bronx in a very small but very full room. It's time to get it done. No more time for talk. No more time for rhetoric. It's time for action. Which is what George Pataki must have had in mind as he hopscotched across the state from morning to night, hitting all the major cities, ending up at a rally in Queens with Mayor Bloomberg and a slew of union leaders surrounding him. Are you going to work the next day? Yeah! Are we, are we going to carry Queens County tomorrow? Yeah! Are we going to carry New York City tomorrow? Yeah! Are we going to win New York State tomorrow? Yeah! Tom Golisano also ended his campaign traveling around upstate before finishing up at home with a small crowd of supporters in Rochester. Well, tomorrow's our day of destiny. We've worked hard in the campaign. We've tried to communicate our message. And we'll know the result probably around 11 or 12 o'clock tomorrow night. No matter what happens, hopefully, because of all three candidates, New York State will be a better place. Now, at this point, the candidates have done pretty much all they can do, but their campaigns will be in high gear tomorrow, using paid staff and volunteers to get their voters to the polls. Will it be enough to cause a shocker tomorrow night? In politics, at least the politicians believe, you've got to believe anything is possible. Chuck? All right, Jay. In New Jersey, Republicans and Democrats are pulling out all the stops to control the Senate. Both Senate candidates crisscross the Garden State, urging voters to head to the polls in tomorrow's crucial election. Linda Beccaro has the story. With just hours until the polls open, the New Jersey Senate candidates work the crowds tonight. Doug Forrester addressing a rally in Ocean County. Frank Lautenberg greeting evening commuters in Monmouth County. The latest Quinnipiac poll shows a widening gap, with Lautenberg beating Forrester by 11 points, 50% to 39. But in Rockaway Township earlier today, Forrester referred to one poll showing he was only five points behind. We came into the weekend with single-digit spread that we would win the election, and we find that the spread is only five points. So we're going to win tomorrow. Well, he's very direct. He doesn't beat about the bush. Lautenberg walked the streets of Red Bank confident he'll regain his old Senate seat. There, he met a 9-11 widow upset over the handling of life insurance policies. She's written to Washington. I don't think uh, that people ought to be penalized if they had uh, take, taken steps to take uh, take care of their families. The candidates were still talking about Saturday's debate when Forrester charged that Lautenberg showed poor judgment by accepting a kiss on the cheek from Yasser Arafat in 1993. I think that it, that is exactly what elections are all about, is questioning judgments. As is the Arab custom, he uh, gave me a little touch of his beard on the cheek, and I thought it was a friendly gesture. I didn't hug him or anything like that. Voters will make their judgment tomorrow. Linda Beccaro, News Channel 4. From the state of the hanging chads, Republican Governor Jeb Bush is leading his Democratic opponent, Bill McBride, by about eight points in the polls. Officials there are doing everything they can to make sure this election goes well. They spent more than $50 million for a computer voting system with touch screens. Another change in Florida's voting system, early voting. People are already lined up to cast their ballot. Well, the death of Senator Paul Wellstone killed in a plane crash has led to a very tight race in Minnesota. The man who replaced him, former Vice President 
Walter Mondale held a heated debate today with his Republican opponent, Norm Coleman. Upstaging them both, Governor Jesse Ventura, who announced Wellstone's Senate replacement, an independent like himself. We're cut out of the process. You, the media, are as big of a uh, uh, guilty party as anybody. You're as guilty as the Democrats and Republicans. As far as I'm concerned, you're in their back pocket. Dean Barkley will serve in the lame duck Senate until the results of tomorrow's election are certified. Well, not only is this one of the most expensive midterm elections ever, it's one of the closest with control of Congress at stake. And tonight, both parties are predicting a photo finish. At least eight races, too close to call, four seats controlled by the Democrats, the blue states, four by the Republicans, the red states. Democrats have a tiny advantage only in that they don't have to pick up any more seats. Republicans have to score net gain of one. So but this is going to be really close. In the House, Republicans appear poised to remain in control, though it is mathematically possible for Democrats to win control of the House. With so many close races, both parties have not forgotten the 2000 election. They have an army of lawyers to watch for potential legal challenges that might make a difference. Now be sure to join us tomorrow on Election Day for live team coverage of the voter turnout, the exit polls, and after the polls close, of course, results of all the closely watched races. Well, tonight police are searching for the killer of a Korean immigrant who was murdered in the middle of the afternoon in his Brooklyn shoe repair shop. The shop is located near a subway station in Park Slope. Detectives say 63-year-old Taesub Kim was shot in the back of the head. No sign of a struggle. Police are not clear whether the gunman killed Kim and then rifled his pockets for cash or shot him after a holdup. Kim leaves behind a wife, three grown children, and four grandchildren. Customers are in shock. I don't see why they would have picked him. He had a small shop. He didn't have too much business. Um, and it's really sad. He was a really nice man. Didn't speak too much English, but he was soft-spoken and always really helpful. And... It's, it's tragic. Police say with no witnesses and no surveillance camera, this could be a tough case to crack. A warning against drinking tap water is still in effect for hundreds of thousands in New Jersey, at least until tomorrow afternoon. A water main break in Jersey City is being blamed. It's affecting service to homes and businesses in Jersey City and Hoboken. The 80-year-old pipe ruptured Sunday, flooding nearby homes. Crews have been working around the clock to try to repair this massive break in the 48-inch main. United Water customers are advised to boil the water at least three minutes before they drink it or cook with it. And tonight, fans who bought his records and neighbors he never abandoned paid their respects to rap legend Jam Master Jay. They waited in line outside a Queen's funeral home to attend his wake. Darlene Rodriguez has the story now live from St. Albans. Darlene? Well, Chuck, at least a thousand people came out to say goodbye to rap star Jam Master Jay. His murder is still unsolved, but there were so many people lining the street here. His wake was held tonight here on Linden Boulevard. The line on the sidewalk outside the J. Foster Phillips funeral home stretched for blocks with mourners paying respect to slain rap DJ Jam Master J. We're living in a society where violence is the norm, and um, a lot of us are just punch drunk from violence and numb. And uh, this is a tragic event, you know, my friend Jay, and this is going to rally the community. The rap star, whose real name is Jason Mizell, was shot last week at his Queens recording studio by a gunman who also shot and wounded Mizell's friend, Uriel Rincon. At Mizell's wake, fans of the rap group Run DMC brought album covers and flowers to remember a man who was considered a pioneer of rap music, helping to bring it to the mainstream almost 20 years ago. It's a sad, and hopefully we can make it a turning point and have a look at this thing and taking control of it. Police still have no suspects in custody, and it's still unclear why Jam Master Jay was killed. They are looking at theories that include his financial troubles and a long-running dispute with a man detectives want to speak to. Myself's cousin says the motive isn't important. The main thing is to find out who did this. You know what I mean? It's not about no debt. It's not about no music. It's about a person who did some harmful thing. Jason Mizell was 37 years old. He leaves behind a wife and three children. His funeral service is set for 10 a.m. tomorrow at the Greater Allen Cathedral on Merrick Boulevard. We're live in Queens. I'm Darlene Rodriguez. Let's go back to you, Sue and Chuck. All right, Darlene, thank you. Now, to learn more about Jam Master Jay and get the latest on the murder investigation, log on to WNBC.com. And still to come as we continue, racist remarks recorded on tape. Now an Nassau County supervisor is out of a job. High-rise security. They say picture IDs are simply not enough, but is fingerprinting residents going too far? And later, a Brooklyn restaurant that's apparently still popular with ghostly mobsters of yesteryear. We'll be right back. 
A Nassau County supervisor accused of making racial slurs during a phone call is out of a job tonight. Linda Alberti was a labor supervisor in the Public Works Department. She was caught on tape using the slurs to refer to a black employee with whom she had once competed for a promotion. Yeah, that's right. Well, they should have given it to Willie Warren. Yeah, they should have given it to him, all right. He's so poverty stricken, the poor I'm telling you, these like having around them because, they, you know, that's good for them. Alberti admitted to investigators that was her voice on the recording. The black employee she was referring to, Willie Warren, has filed a bias complaint after he was turned down for a promotion Alberti received. Now his attorney says Warren plans to file a civil rights lawsuit against Nassau County. Controversy tonight over a security plan at a New York apartment complex. The Manhattan Plaza high-rise on West 43rd Street already has security cameras and guards present. present. Residents must also show digital ID photos, and now landlords want to fingerprint tenants and have their prints scanned every time they enter the building. But some tenants call this plan unnecessary and an invasion of privacy. You're going to be bombed. Well, wait a minute. They're gonna, they could bomb me anyway. This is silly. I don't think it's an invasion at all. I mean, it's a requirement that's going to benefit the entire building. The city's housing preservation development, which enforces building codes, says the fingerprinting is legal. Up next, Janice Hoff's the Election Day forecast. And friendly ghosts, they are not. Some say mobsters are haunting a restaurant in Brooklyn. We'll have that story coming up next. <laughs> Wait, all right, we can't have, we can't have inside I'll jokes. Some of them are coming down with colds, and I was just sort of I see. clearing yeah. the air. If you notice where she was clearing it, it'd be right over to you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> got a great forecast for tomorrow. Ah, Election well. day, that's coming up, tell you all about it. Uh, now the sky's clearing outside and the temperatures are cooling off in a few spots. In Central Park right now, we have a reading of 44 degrees. Clouds earlier today have moved on to the east and now the skies are clear. Winds are out of the west, 7 miles per hour. They'll turn more to the northwest. Relative humidity is at 83% and the pressure is rising at 30.09. Let's take a check of today's high and low. We made it to 51 today. 57 is the average high temperature, so we weren't that far off. 41 was the morning low and the rainfall light measuring to 0 0.03. But now the rain has moved on. Temperatures have fallen to the 30s in Morristown and Trenton. It's going to be chilly tonight, north and west of the city. A few 30s now in Albany, Messina. Not dreadfully cold air behind the system that just came through, although there has been some light snow reported across northern sections of New England. This is the storm system that we're watching now. This energy, this rain, will start to transfer towards the uh, east coast, and then a low will develop and move up the eastern seaboard on Wednesday. And we expect a cool, windy, rainy, raw day here on Wednesday. But before that happens, you'll have great weather for tomorrow, Election Day. Starting out with sun and some clouds increasing later in, later in the afternoon, temperatures will range between the upper 40s and mid-50s for tomorrow. So a dry day is expected. No major uh, problems at all with the weather in terms of getting out and boating. In terms of uh, travel forecast from coast to coast, you'll find showers in Chicago and rain in Atlanta, a mix of rain and snow around the Minneapolis area, sunshine in Denver, a high of 58, near 80 in Phoenix, and 71 in Los Angeles, Seattle, with a mix of sun and clouds tomorrow and highs in the upper 50s. Here's our forecast for tonight across the tri-state air area. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> See what you started, Sue? Generally clear skies for tonight. Uh, temperatures uh, in the 30s and low 40s. But so we'll be a little chilly out. Tomorrow morning, we'll have the sun to start the day. Maybe you may get out early to vote. It'll be nice and sunny and a few late-day clouds, a high of 52 in the city. Five-day forecast. Uh, looks good for tomorrow, but rain and wind on Wednesday. A chilly rain, too, with highs in the 40s. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, a mix of sun and clouds. Looks great going into the weekend with highs in the low to mid-50s. Maybe even by Sunday, the upper 50s. And Monday's a holiday for a lot of people. Veterans Day, I guess, is holiday. Uh -huh. And the weather looks pretty good then, too. Name this right. tune. Uh-oh. What? <laughs> Happy birthday, dear <laughs> Happy birthday, uh, dear uh, 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. What a wonderful <laughs> heartfelt rendition that was, too. Well, we have to be dignified. It's news, you know. <laughs> Well, now to the haunting. When you think of a haunted house, odds are you don't usually envision a restaurant. But as Joe Avalar reports, such a place may exist, not in our imagination, but in Brooklyn. Haunted houses should look like this. Old, dark, forbidding places. 
No one thinks of 18th Avenue in Bensonhurst as the site of a haunting. Just a busy street in a busy neighborhood with a nondescript busy family restaurant in the middle of the block, probably like one near you. But in the basement, sometimes, some people say, something looks. You know, I was coming upstairs, the door just shut. It wasn't supposed to shut, and it just closed by itself. There was nobody down there. Another waiter says he saw something in the basement. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed someone down near the boilers. I didn't think anything of it. So I go get the walk in the walking box, take the cake, go out, and there's no one there. And no one was in the basement. This is the walk-in box. It's a giant refrigerator. Alex saw that something again. When I went in the walking box, the door was closing, and I saw someone walk by, like, into the wall. The waiters say they feel a malevolent stare every time they descend into the basement. Strange occurrences have happened upstairs, too. When Angela Perone, the current owner's cousin, was alone painting the restaurant, she says... I heard voices. There were two men talking to each other, and I went in search of the conversation. And I walked from room to room, and there was nobody in this restaurant. Danza's has a violent past. It used to be a mob hangout. And 15 years ago, its co-owner, Michael Frankie DeBat, was murdered here while tending bar. Police say they never had anything on Frank DeBat. He had no criminal record, no arrests. Today, all they had on him was a tablecloth. The restaurant's other owner, Sammy the Bull Gravano, confessed to ordering the hit. In 1995, a third co-owner, Joseph Stymie D'Angelo, was also shot down here. Although not the shots that killed DeBat, bullet holes still marked the wall near where DeBat's body was found. And the current owner, Stephen Carroll, says he saw something there. I was sitting on the counter looking towards this wall over here, and we suddenly I just saw an image uh, pass by right through the wall. It was, uh, I guess, say, from a torso up. These are pictures allegedly of otherworldly objects the New York Ghost Chapter found when they investigated dances. Specialists in paranormal occurrences say films showed this face over a bar near where Michael DeBat was shot. Could it be his face coming back? You sure you want to do this, Jeff? I'm sure I want to do this. Right. We tried to recreate something the Ghost Chapter did. We put a recorder in the basement and tried to entice the ghosts to talk to us. Let us know you're here. Tip quarters running. We're leaving the basement. Lights off. Barone says the New York Ghost chapter recorded voices calling names, a chainsaw, and a scream. Urban legend has it, mobsters hurt their enemies down there. But our recording found nothing. The ghosts declined to comment. I don't think that spirits will appear just because you want them to. I think they appear because they choose to. And I think just because you were there and filming, that might have been a good reason for them not to appear. There may be logical explanations for everything that's happened at dances, but maybe the best explanation is also the one you choose to believe. The only way that you could really prove if there's life after death is if somebody actually died, came back, and then you could ask them. Joe Avalar, News Channel 4. Mm -hmm. Still ahead, Winona Ryder and her shoplifting charge. The case is in the hands of the jury tonight. And in sports, the lowly Knicks hosting Sam Cassell and the Bucks. Not exactly a packed house at the Garden tonight. The Nets, on the other hand, looking to stay unbeaten, taking on the T-Wolves at the Meadowlands. We'll be right back with Lynn Berman. <coughs> oh, battle of the Titans at the Garden tonight, huh? Well, battle of uh, winless teams. Knicks looking for their first win, <laughs> hosting similarly winless Milwaukee. And tonight at the Garden, not a sellout. Ending the streak of 433 consecutive games dating back to 1993. The Bucks in purple, second quarter. Sam Cassell right down Broadway. Bucks go up 56-42 at the half, but the Knicks fought back, led by Allen Houston. Houston ties the game at 80. Houston had 28, and then the Bucks reel off seven straight points. Sam Cassell gives them a seven-point lead. Cassell torching them repeatedly in the fourth, finished with 22. Milwaukee wins at 97-88. The Knicks 0-4 for the first time in 15 years. Attendance, 18,100. That's 1,600 shy of capacity. So, for those who attended, they were part of something new. They could watch their Knicks alongside some empty seats.
Well, I have a place to put my jacket now. The garden usually sells out, but tonight I have a lot of leg room. They're putting out a bad product right now. They need a good team. They get a good team, the guard will be filled in a minute. There you go. The 3 and 0 Nets hosting Minnesota. Nets in the home white trailed by 10 early, but Richard Jefferson soars for the dunk. The Nets led up by 5 at the half. Wow, a huge third quarter. Dikembe Mutombo with the block. And at the other end, Jason Kidd, part of a 13 nothing run and what a third quarter for Jefferson. That made it a 20-point lead. Jefferson with 17 of his 22 in the third. Nets win again 106-82. They start the season 4-0. and oh. How about Giants coach Jim Fossil? He goes out on a limb calling his own plays, and last night, they win. In the priority of making that decision has nothing to do with, is this going to expose Jim Fossil or not? It doesn't come into the equation. A couple times I've made some pretty hard decisions. Bottom line is, my thought process, I'll put it on my shoulders. If you don't like it, you get the one target, shoot at it. And so that's sometimes that's just my nature. It's not going right. Okay, just bring, bring all the dirt towards me and let's go. Let's go. Giants and Jets both winning on the same day. First time that's happened since last December the 23rd. Jets not only winning, but pounding San Diego 44-13. Where has this team been all year? That was our game where we just hit it all now. I mean, we, we, we hit on all the cylinders we could hit on. We did a lot of things good. But I think our players prepared themselves for that, too. And they had that mindset that that's what it was going to take for us to beat these guys. And they did. Hockey, the Islanders hosting Calgary. Flames in black. As the Islanders fought back to tie to two. Early third. Chris Drury, the backhander, beats Garth Snow. Calgary wins it 4-2. It's now a four-game losing streak for these Islanders. And at the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto, former Islander Clark Gillies, one of those inducted, the seventh of the great Islander teams of the 80s to be so inducted. Gillies remembering his father at the ceremony. Didn't get a chance to see us win the Stanley Cup, but um, Dad, it truly is awesome. And uh, I know you've been watching every step of the way. Clark Gilly is one of the Islander tough guys. And you've heard the sports cliche, a player carrying his team on his shoulders. How about the reverse? Marshall University in white. Their fine quarterback, Byron Leftwich, hurts his leg in the first quarter against Akron. He heads to the hospital for x-rays. They're negative. So he returns to action. He goes back into the game in the second half. Gamely tries to lead his team, but Akron holds on for the win. But between plays, his linemen lift him on their shoulders and march him down the field to get him ready for the next play. How about that? Now that's teamwork. That's frightening. <laughs> and that's for <laughs> I'll sing happy birthday again. Uh, happy, <laughs> happy birthday time. to you. No, that's okay. To my favorite anchorman well, in the whole you. world. I love you too. Dear. Thank, thank you. you. We'll be right back. <laughs>